16. Bloodborne. Thomas Covenant spent the next three days in one long, acute discovery of saddle soreness. Sitting on thin leather, he felt as if he were riding bareback. The hard, physical fact of Dura's spine threatened to saw him open. His knees felt as if they were being twisted out of joint. His thighs and calves ached and quivered with the strain of gripping his mount, a pain which slowly spread into and up his back, and his neck throbbed from the lash of Dira's sudden lurchings as she crossed the obstacles of the terrain. At times he remained on her back only because the Klingor saddle did not let him fall. And at night his clenched muscles hurt so badly that he could not sleep without the benefit of diamond draft. As a result, he noticed little of the passing countryside, or the weather, or the mood of the company. He ignored or rebuffed every effort to draw him into conversation. He was consumed by the painful sensation of being broken in half. Once again, he was forced to recognize the suicidal nature of this dream, of what the subconscious darkness of his mind was doing to him. But the giant's diamond draft and the land's impossible health worked in him regardless of his suffering. His flesh grew tougher to meet the demands of Dura's back, and without knowing it, he had been improving as a rider. He was learning how to move with instead of resisting his mount. When he woke up after the third night, he found that physical hurting no longer dominated him. By that time, the company had left behind the cultivated region around Revelstone and had moved out into rough plains. They had camped in the middle of, the, of a rude flatland, and when Covenant began to look about him, the terrain that met his eyes was rocky and unpromising. Nevertheless, the sense of moving forward reasserted itself in him, gave him once again the illusion of safety. Like so many other things, Revelstone was behind him. When Foam Follower addressed him, he was able to respond without violence. At that, the giant remarked to Morum, Stone and sea, my lord, I believe that Thomas Covenant has chosen to rejoin the living. Surely this is the work of Diamond Draft. Hail, Ur Lord Covenant, welcome to our company. Do you know, Lord Morum? There is an ancient giantish tale about a war which was halted by Diamond Draft. Would you like to hear? I can tell it in half a day. Indeed, Morum chuckled. And will it take only half a day if you tell it on the run while we ride? Foam Follower laughed broadly. Then I can be done by sunset tomorrow. I, Saltheart Foam Follower, say it. I have heard that tale, High Lord Prothal said, but the teller assured me that Diamond Draft did not, in fact, end the conflict. The actual reign was giantish talk. When the giants were done asking after the causes of the war, combatants had been listening so long that they had forgotten the answer. Ah, High Lord, Foam Follower chortled, you misunderstand. It was the giants who drank the diamond draft. Laughter burst from the listening warriors, and Prothal smiled as they turned to mount his horse. As he turned to mount his horse. Soon the quest was on its way, and Covenant fell into place beside Morum. Now as he rode, Covenant listened to the traveling noises of the company. The lords and bloodguard were almost entirely silent, preoccupied. But over the thud of hooves, he could hear talk and snatches of song from the warriors. In Quan's leadership, they sounded confident and occasionally eager, as if they looked forward to putting their years of sword training to the test. Some time later, Lord Morum surprised Covenant by saying, without preamble, Or Lord, as you know, there were questions which the council did not ask of you. May I ask them now? I should like to know more concerning your world. My world. 
and Covenant swallowed roughly. He did not want to talk about it. He had no desire to repeat the ordeal of the council. Why? Morham shrugged. Because the more I know of you, the better I will know what to expect from you in times of peril, or because an understanding of your world may teach me to treat you rightly, or because I have asked the question in simple friendship. Covenant could hear the candor in Morham's voice, and it disarmed his refusals. He owed the lords and himself some kind of honesty. But that debt was bitter to him, and he could not find any easy way to articulate all the things which needed saying. Instinctively, he began to make a list. We have cancer, heart failure, tuberculosis, multiple sclerosis, birth defects, leprosy. We have alcoholism, venereal disease, drug addiction, rape, robbery, murder, child beating, genocide. But he could not bear to utter a catalog of woes that might run on forever. After a moment, he stood in his stirrups and gestured out over the ruggedness of the plains. You probably see it better than I do, but even I can tell that this is beautiful. It's alive. It's alive the way it should be alive. This kind of grass is yellow and stiff and thin, but I can see that it's healthy. It belongs here in this kind of soil. By hell, I can even see what time of year this is by looking at the dirt. I can see spring. Where I come from, we don't see. If you don't know the annual cycles of the plants, you can't tell the difference between spring and summer. If you don't have a, have a standard of comparison, you can't recognize. But the world is beautiful. What's left of it? What we haven't damaged? Images of Haven Farm sprang irrefusably across his mind. He could not restrain the mordancy of his tone as he concluded, We have beauty too. We call it scenery. Scenery, Morham echoed. The word is strange to me, but I do not like the sound. Covenant felt oddly shaken, as if he had just looked over his shoulder and found himself standing too close to a precipice. It means that beauty is something extra, he rasped. It's nice, but we can live without it. Without? Morham's gaze glittered dangerously, and behind him, Foam Follower breathed in astonishment. Live without beauty? Ah, oh, my friend, how do you resist despair? I don't think we do, Covenant muttered. Some of us are just stubborn. Then he fell silent. Morham asked him no more questions, and he rode on chewing the gristle of his thoughts until High Lord Prothal called a rest halt. As the day progressed, Covenant's silence seemed slowly to infect the company. The traveling banter and singing of the yeomen faded gradually into stillness. Morham watched Covenant curiously askance, but made no effort to renew their conversation, and High Lord Prothal looked as night-faced as the bloodguard. After a time, Covenant guessed the cause of their reticence. Tonight would be the first full of the bloody moon. A shiver ran through him. That night would be a kind of test of Drool's power. If the cave white could maintain his red hold even when the moon was full, then the lords would have to admit that his might had no discernible limit. And such might would be spawning armies, would almost certainly have already produced marauders to feed Drool's taste for pillage. Then the company would have to fight for passage. Covenant remembered with a shudder his brief meeting with Drool in the cavern of Carol Threndor. Like his companions, he fell under the pall of what the night might reveal. 
Only Variol and Tamarantha seemed untouched by the common mood. She appeared half asleep and rode casually, trusting the Ranahin to keep her on its back. Her husband sat erect, with a steady hand on his reins, but his mouth was his mouth was slack and his eyes unfocused. They looked frail. Covenant felt that he could see the brittleness of their bones, but they alone of all the company were blithe against the coming night, blithe, blithe or uncomprehending. The riders camped before dusk on the north side of a rough hill, partially sheltered from the prevailing southwest breeze. The air had turned cold like a revisitation of winter, and the wind carried a chill to the hearts of the travelers. In silence, some of the warriors fed and rubbed down their horses, while others cooked, to sp cooked a spare meal over a fire that Berenere coaxed from one of his Lilianril rods and some scrub wood. The Ranahin galloped away together to spend the night in some secret play or rite, leaving the horses hobbled and the blood guard standing sentinel and the rest of the company huddled in their cloaks around the fire. As the last of the sunlight scudded from the air, the breeze stiffened into a steady wind. Covenant found himself wishing for some of the camaraderie that had begun the day, but he could not supply the lack himself. He had to wait until High Lord Prothol rose to meet the apprehension of the quest. Planting his staff firmly, he began to sing the Vespers hymn of Revelstone. Morum joined him, following by, followed by Variol and Tamarantha, and soon the whole Ilmen was on its feet, adding its many-throated voice to the song. There they stood under the stern sky, twenty-five souls singing like witnesses. Seven hells for failed faith, for land's betrayers, man and wraith, and one brave lord to deal the doom, to keep the blacking blight from beauty's bloom. They raised their voices bravely, and their melody was counterpointed by the tenor roll of foam followers' plain song. When they were done, they reseated themselves and began to talk together in low voices, as if the hymn were all they needed to restore their courage. Covenant sat staring at his knotted hands. Without taking his eyes off them, he knew when moonrise came. He felt the sudden stiffening around him as the first crimson glow appeared on the horizon. But he gnawed on his lip and did not look up. His companions breathed tensely. A red cast slowly deepened in the heart of the fire, but he clenched his gaze as if he were studying the way his knuckles whitened. Then he heard Lord Morham's agonized whisper, Melancurian, and he knew that the moon was full red, stained as if its defilement were complete, as bloody as if the night sky had been cut to the heart. He felt the light touch his face, and his cheek twitched in revulsion. The next moment, there came a distant wail like a cry of protest. It throbbed like desolation in the chill air. In spite of himself, Covenant looked over the blood-hued plain. For an instant, he expected the company to leap to the relief of that call. But no one moved. The cry must have come from some animal. Glancing briefly at the full violated moon, he changed his grip and lowered his eyes again. When his gaze reached his fingers, he saw in horror that the moonlight gave his ring a reddish cast. The metal looked as if it had been dipped in blood. Its inner silver struggled to show through the crimson, but the bloodlight seemed to be soaking inward, slowly quenching perverting the white gold. 
he understood instinctively. For one staggering heartbeat, he sat still, howled silent and futile warnings at his unsuspecting self. Then he sprang to his feet, erect and rigid, as if he had been yanked, upright by the moon. Arms tight at his sides, fists clenched. Behind him, Banor said, Do not fear, O Lord. The Ranihin will warn us if the wolves are any danger. Covenant turned his head. The bloodguard reached a restraining hand toward him. Don't touch me, Covenant hissed. He jerked away from Banor. For an instant while his heart labored, he observed how the crimson moon made Banor's face look like old lava. Then a vicious sense of wrong exploded under his feet, and he pitched toward the fire. As he struck the earth, he flung himself onward, careless of everything but his intense, visceral need to escape the attack. After one roll, his legs crashed among the flaming brands. But as Covenant fell, Banor sprang forward. When Covenant hit the fire, the blood guard was only a stride away. He caught Covenant's wrist in almost the same instant, heaved him child light out of the flames and onto his feet. Even before he had regained his balance, Covenant spun on Banor and yelled into the blood guard's face, Don't touch me! Banor released Covenant's wrist, backed away a step. Prothal, Morum, Foam Follower, and all the warriors were on their feet. They stared at Covenant in surprise, confusion, outrage. He felt suddenly weak. His legs trembled. He dropped to his knees beside the fire. Thinking, hell fire and bloody foul has done it to me. He's taking me over, damnation. He pointed an unsteady finger at the ground that had stung him. There, he gasped. It was there. I felt it. The lords reacted immediately. While Morum shouted for Birinair, Prothal hurried forward and stooped over the spot Covenant indicated. Mumbling softly to himself, he touched the spot with the tips of his fingers like a physician testing a wound. Then he was joined by Morum and Birinair. Birinair thrust the High Lord aside, took his Lilianrel staff, and placed its end on the sore place. Rotating the staff between his palms, he concentrated imperiously on his beloved wood. For one moment, Prothal murmured, for one moment I felt something, some memory in the earth. Then it passed beyond my touch. He sighed. It was terrible. Birner echoed, terrible, talking to himself in his concentration. Prothal and Morum watched him as his hands trembled with either age or sensitivity. Abruptly he cried, Terrible! The hand of the slayer! He dares do this? He snatched himself away so quickly that he stumbled and would have fallen if Prothal had not caught him. Momentarily, Prothal and Birinair met each other's eyes as if they were trying to exchange some knowledge that could not be voiced. Then Birinair shook himself free, Looking about him, as if he could see the shards of his dignity scattered around his feet, he mumbled gruffly, Stand on my own. Not that old yet. After a glance at Covenant, he went on more loudly, You think I am old. Of course, old and foolish. Push himself into a quest when he should be resting his bones by the hearth, like a lump. Pointing toward the unbeliever, he concluded, Ask him, ask. Covenant. Covenant had climbed to his feet while the attention of the company was on the higher brand and had pushed his hands into his pockets to hide the hue of his ring. As Beriner pointed at him, he raised his eyes from the ground. A sick feeling of presage twisted his stomach as he remembered his attacks in Andalane and what had followed them. 
Grothal said firmly, Step there again, our lord. Grimacing, Covenant strode forward and stamped his foot on the spot. As his heel hit the ground, he winced in expectation, tried to brace himself for the sensation that at this one point the earth had become insecure, foundationless. But nothing stung him. As in Andaline, the ill had vanished, leaving him with the impression that a veneer of trustworthiness had been replaced over, the, over a pit. In answer to the silent question of the lords, he shook his head. After a pause, Morham said evenly, You have felt this before. With an effort, Covenant forced himself to say, Yes, several times, in Andaline, before that attack on the celebration. The hand of the great slayer touched you, Baronair spat. But he could not sustain his accusation. His bones seemed to remember their age, and he sagged tiredly, leaned on his staff. In an awed tone of self-reproach, as if he were apologizing, he mumbled, Of course, younger, if I were younger. He turned from the company and shuffled away to his bed beyond the circle. Why did you not tell us? Morham asked severely. The question made Covenant feel suddenly ashamed, as if his ring were visible through the fabric of his pants. His shoulders hunched, drove his hands deeper into his pockets. I didn't... At first I didn't want you to know what... How important Fowl and Drool think I am. After that... He referred to his crisis in the close with his eyes. I was thinking about other things. Morham accepted this with a nod, and after a moment Covenant went on. I don't know what it is, but I only get it through my boots. I can't touch it with my hands or my feet. Morham and Prothal shared a glance of surprise. Shortly, the High Lord said, Unbeliever, the cause of these attacks surpasses me. Why do your boots make you sensitive to this wrong? I do not know. But either Lord Morham or myself must remain by you at all times, so that we may, respond, we may respond without delay. Over his shoulder, he said, First Mark Tuvor, Warhaf Kwan, have you heard? Quan came to attention and replied, Yes, High Lord. And from behind the circle, Tuvor's voice carried softly, There will be an attack, we have heard. Readiness will be needed, said Morham grimly, and stout hearts to face an onslaught of Irviles and wolves and cave whites without faltering. That is so, the High Lord said at last, but such things will come in their own time. Now we must rest. We must gather strength. Slowly, the company began the business of bedding down. Humming his giantish plain song, Foam Follower stretched out on the ground with his arm around his leather flask of diamond draft. While the blood guard set watches, the Warriors spread blankets for themselves and, their, and the lords. Covenant went to bed self-consciously, as if he felt the company studying him, and he was glad of the blankets that helped him hide his ring. Then he lay awake long into the night, feeling too cold to sleep. The blankets did not keep out the, the chill which emanated from his ring. But until he finally fell asleep, he could hear foam followers humming, and see Prothal sitting by the embers of the fire. The giant and the high lord kept watch together, two old friends of the land sharing some vigil against their impending doom. The next day dawned gray and cheerless, overcast with clouds like ashes in the sky, and into it Covenant rode bent in his saddle as if he had a weight around his neck. 
His ring had lost its red stain with the setting of the moon, but the color remained in his mind, and the ring seemed to drag him down like a meaningless crime. Helplessly, he perceived that, a, that an allegiance he had not chosen, could not have chosen, was being forced upon him. The evidence seemed irrefutable. Like the moon, he was falling prey to Lord Fowl's machinations. His volition was not required. The strings which dangled him were strong enough to overbear any resistance. He did not understand how it could happen to him. Was his death wish, his leper's weariness or despair so strong? What had become of his obdurate instinct for survival? What was, where was his anger, his violence? Had he been victimized for so long that now he could only respond as a victim, even to himself? He had no answers. He was sure of nothing but the fear which came over him when the company halted at noon. He found that he did not want to get down from Dura's back. He distrusted the ground, dreaded contact with it. He had lost a fundamental confidence, his faith that the earth was stable, a faith so obvious and constant and necessary that it had been unconscious until now, had been shaken. Blind, blind silent soil had become a dark hand, malevolently seeking out him and him alone. Nevertheless, he swung down from the saddle, forced himself, set foot on the ground, and was stung. The virulence of the sensation made all his nerves cringe, and he could hardly stand as he watched Prothol and Morum and Birinair try to capture what he had felt. But they failed completely. The misery of that ill touch withdrew the instant he jumped away from it. That evening, during supper, he was stung again. When he went to bed to hide his ring from the moon, he shivered as if he were feverish. On the morning of the sixth day, he arose with a gray face and a crippled look in his eyes. Before he could mount Dura, he was stung again. and again during one of the company's rest halts. And again, the instant he mustered enough despair to dismount at the end of the day's ride. The wrong felt like another spike in his coffin lid. This time his nerves reacted so violently that he tumbled to the ground like a demonstration of futility. He had to lie still for a long time before he could coax his arms and legs under control again. And when he finally regained his feet, he jerked and winced with fear at every step. Pathetic, pathetic, he panted to himself, but he could not find the rage to master it. With keen concern in his eyes, Foam Follower asked him why he did not take off his boots. Covenant had to think for a moment before he could remember why. Then he murmured, they're part of me. They're part of the way I have to live. I don't have very many parts left. And besides, he added wanly, if I don't have, if I don't keep having these fits, how is Prothol going to figure them out? Do not do such a thing for us, Morum replied intently. How could we ask it? But Covenant only shrugged and went to sit by the fire. He could not face food that night. The thought of eating made his raw nerves nauseous. But he tried a few aliantha from a bush near the camp and found that they had a calming effect. He ate a handful of the berries, absentmindedly tossing away the seeds as Lena had taught him, and returned to the fire. When the company had finished its meal, Morum seated himself beside Covenant. Without looking at him, the Lord asked, How can we help you? Should we build a litter so that you will not have to touch the earth? 
Or are there other ways? Perhaps one of Foam Follower's tales would ease your heart. I have heard giants boast that the despiser himself would become an earth friend if he could be made to listen to the story of Bagun the Unbearable and Thelma Two-Fist. Such healing there is in stories. Abruptly, Morum turned squarely toward Covenant, and Covenant saw that the Lord's face was full of sympathy. I see your pain, er Lord. Covenant hung his head to avoid Morum's gaze, made sure his left hand was securely in his pocket. After a moment, he said distantly, Tell me about the Creator. Ah, Morum sighed, we do not, do not know that a Creator lives. Our only lore of such a being comes from the most shadowy reaches of our oldest legends. We know the despiser, but the creator we do not know. And then Covenant was vaguely startled to hear Lord Tamarantha cut in. Of course we know. Ah, the folly of the young. Morum, my son, you are not yet a prophet. You must learn that kind of courage. Slowly, she pulled her ancient limbs together and got to her feet, leaning on her staff for support. Her thin white hair hung in wisps about her face as she moved into the circle around the fire, muttering frailly, Oracles and prophecy are incompatible. According to Kevin's lore, only Hartfew, the Lord Fatherer, was both seer and prophet. Lesser souls lose the paradox. Why, I do not know. But when Kevin Landwaster decided in his heart to invoke the ritual of desecration, he saved the blood guard and the Ranahin and the giants because he was an oracle. And because he was no prophet, he failed to see that Lord Fowl would survive. A lesser man than Beric. Of course, the Creator lives. She looked over at Varial for confirmation, and he nodded, but Covenant could not tell whether he was approving or drowsing. But Tamarantha nodded in return as if Varial had supported her. Lifting her head to see night sky and the stars, she spoke in a voice fragile with age. Of course, the Creator lives she repeated. How else? Opposites require each other. Otherwise, the difference is lost, and only chaos remains. No, there can be no despite without creation. Better to ask how the Creator could have forgotten that when he made the earth. Could have forgotten that when he made the earth. For if he did not forget, then creation and despite existed together in his one being, and he did not know it. This the elder legends tell us. Into the infinity before time was made, came the creator like a worker into his workshop. And since it is the nature of creating to desire perfection, the creator devoted all himself to the task. First he built the Arch of Time, so that his creation would have a place in which to be. And for the keystone of that arch, he forged the wild magic, so that time would be able to resist chaos and endure. Then within the arch, he formed the earth. For ages he labored, formed and unformed, trialed and tested and rejected and trialed and tested again, so that when he was done, his creation would have no cause to reproach him. And when the earth was fair to his eye, he gave birth to the inhabitants of the earth, beings to act out in their lives his reach for perfection, and he did not neglect to give them the means to strive for perfection themselves. When he was done, he was proud as only those who create can be. Alas, he did not understand despite, or had forgotten it. 
he undertook his task thinking that perfect labor was all that he required to create perfection. But when he was done and his pride had tasted its first satisfaction, he looked closely at the earth, thinking to gratify himself with the sight, and he was dismayed. For behold, buried deep in the earth, through no will or forming of his, were banes of destruction, powers virile enough to rip his masterwork into dust. Then he understood or remembered. Perhaps he found despite itself beside him, misguiding his hand, or perhaps he saw the harm in himself. It does not matter. He became outraged with grief and torn pride. In his fury, he wrestled with despite, either within him or without, and in his fury, he cast the despiser down, out of the infinity of the cosmos and onto the earth. Alas, thus the despiser was imprisoned within time, and thus the creator's creation became the despiser's world to torment as he chose. For the very law of time, the principle of power which made the arch possible, worked to preser preserve Lord Fowl, as we now call him. The law requires that no act may be undone, desecration may not be undone, defilement, defilement may not be recanted. It may be survived or healed, but not denied. Therefore, Lord Fowl has afflicted the earth, and the Creator cannot stop him, for it was the Creator's act which placed despite here. In sorrow and humility, the Creator saw what he had done. So that the plight of the earth would not be utterly without hope, he sought to help his creation in indir indirect ways. He guided the Lord Fatherer to the fashioning of the Staff of Law, a weapon against despite. But the very law of the earth's creation permits nothing more. If the Creator were to silence Lord Fowl, that act would destroy time, and then the despiser would be free in infinity again, free to make whatever befoulments he desired. Tamarantha paused. She had told her tale simply, without towering rhetoric or agitation or any sign of passion beyond her agedness. But for a moment, her thin old voice convinced Covenant that the universe was at stake, that his own struggle was only a microcosm of a far greater conflict. During that moment, he waited in suspense for what she would say next. Shortly, she lowered her gaze. Shortly, she lowered her head head and turned her wrinkled gaze full on him. Almost whispering, she said, Thus we are come to the greatest test. The wild magic is here. With a word, our world could be riven to the core. Do not mistake, she quavered. If we cannot win this unbeliever to our cause, then the earth will end in rubble. But Covenant could not tell whether her voice shook because she was old or because she was afraid. Moonrise was near. He went to his bed to avoid exposing the alteration of his ring. With his head under the blankets, he stared into the blackness, saw when the moon came up by the bloody glow which grew in his wedding band. The metal seemed more deeply stained than it had two nights ago. It held his covered gaze like a fixation, and when he finally slept, he was as exhausted as if he had been worn out under an interrogation. The next morning he managed to reach Dura's back without being attacked, and he groaned in unashamed relief. Then Prothal broke his usual habit and did not call for a halt at noon. The reason became clear when the riders topped a rise 
and came in sight of the Solsis River. They rode down out of the harsh plains and swam their horses across the river before stopping to rest. And there again Covenant was not attacked when he set foot on the ground. But the rest of the day contrasted grimly with this inexplicable respite. A few leagues beyond the Solsis, the quest came upon a waymeet for the first time. Remembering Covenant's tale of a murdered Wainahim, Prothal sent two bloodguard, Korik and Terrell, who warded Lord Morham, into the waymeet. The investigation was only necessary for confirmation. Even Covenant, in his straitened condition, could see the neglect, smell the disuse. The green traveler's ha haven had gone brown and sour. When Korik and Terrell, <clears throat> when Korik and Terrell returned, they could only report what the company had already perceived. The waymeat was untended. The lords met this discovery with stern faces. Clearly, they had feared that the murder covenant had described would lead the Wainahim to end their service. But several of the warriors groaned in shock and dismay, and Foam Follower ground his teeth. Covenant glanced around at the giant, and for a moment saw Foam Follower's face suffused with fury. The expression passed quickly, but it left Covenant feeling shaken. Unexpectedly, he sensed that the unmarred loyalty of the giants to the land was dangerous. It was quick to judge. So there was a gloom on the company at the end of the seventh day, a gloom which could only be aggravated by the moon, incarnadine and corrupt, as it colored the night like a conviction of disaster. Only Covenant received any relief. Once again, his private stalking ill left him alone. But the next day brought the riders in sight of Andalane. Their path lay along the outskirts of the hills on the southwest side, and even through the hanging gray weather, the richness of Andalane glistened like the proudest gem of the earth. It made the company feel light-boned, affected the quest like a living view of what the land had been like before the desecration. Covenant needed that quiet consolation as much as anyone, but it was denied him. While eating breakfast, he had been bitten again by the wrong in the earth. The previous day's respite seemed only to multiply the virulence of the attack. It was compact with malevolence, as if that respite had frustrated it, intensified its spite. The sensation of wrong left him foundering. During one of the rest halts, he was struck again. And that evening, while he made himself a supper of Aliantha, he was struck again. This time, the wrong lashed him so viciously that he passed out for some time. When he regained consciousness, he was lying in Foam Follower's arms like a child. He felt vaguely that he had had convulsions. Take off your boots, Foam Follower urged intently. Numbness filled Covenant's head like mist, clouded his reactions. But he mustered the lucidity to ask, Why? Why? Stone and sea, my friend. When you ask like that, how can I answer? Ask yourself, what do you gain by enduring such wrong? Myself, he murmured faintly. He wanted to simply... He wanted simply to recline in the giant's arms and sleep, but he fought the desire, pushed himself away from Foam Follower until the giant set him on his feet by Berenair's Lilianril fire. For a moment, he had to cling decrepitly to Foam Follower's arm to support himself, but then one of the warriors gave him his staff and he braced himself on it by resisting. 
but he knew in his bones that he was not resisting. He felt weak, as if they were melting under the strain. They felt weak, as if they were melting under the strain. His boots had become a hollow symbol for an intransigence he no longer felt. Foam followers started to object, but Morum stopped him. It is his choice, the Lord said softly. After a while, Covenant fell into feverish sleep. He did not know that he was carried tenderly to bed, did not know that Morum watched over him during the night, and saw the bloody stain on his wedding band. He reached some sort of crisis while he slept, and awoke with the feeling that he had lost, that his ability to endure had reached the final either-or of a toss which had gone against him. His throat was parched like a battleground. When he, fo when he forced his eyes open, he found himself again prostrated in foam followers' arms. Around him, the company was ready to mount for the day's ride. When he saw Covenant's eyes open, Foam Follower bent over him and said quietly, I would rather bear you in my arms than see you suffer. Our journey to Lord's Keep was easier for me than watching you now. Part of Covenant rallied to look at the giant. Foam Follower's face showed strain, but it was not the strain of exhaustion. Rather, it seemed like the pre a pressure building up in his mind, a pressure that made the fortress of his forehead appear to bulge. Covenant stared at it dumbly for a long moment before he realized that it was sympathy. The sight of his own pain made Foam Follower's pulse throb in his temples. Giants? Covenant breathed to himself. Are they all like this? Watching that concentration of emotion, he murmured, What's a Foam Follower? The giant did not appear to notice the irrelevance of the question. A follower is a compass, he answered simply. So, foam follower, sea compass. Covenant began weakly moving, trying to get out of the giant's arms, but foam follower held him, forbade him in silence to set his feet on the ground. Lord Morham intervened. With grim determination in his voice, he said, set him down. Down, Covenant echoed. Several retorts passed under Foam Follower's heavy brows, but he only said, why? I have decided, Morham replied. We will not move from this place until we understand what is happening to Erlord Covenant. I have delayed this risk too long. Death gathers around us. Set him down. His eyes flashed dangerously. Still, Foam Follower hesitated until he saw High Lord Prothal nod support for Morum. Then he turned Covenant upright and lowered him gently to the ground. For an instant, his hands rested protectively on Covenant's shoulders. Then he stepped back. Now, our Lord, said Morum, give me your hand. We will stand together until you feel the ill, and I feel it through you. At that, a coil of weak panic writhed in Covenant's heart. He saw himself reflected in Morham's eyes, saw himself standing lornly with what he had lost written in his face. That loss dismayed him. In that tiny, reflected face, he perceived abruptly that if the attacks continued, he would inevitably learn to enjoy the sense of horror and loathing which they gave him. He had discovered a frontier into the narcissism of revulsion, and Morham was asking him to risk crossing over. Come, the Lord urged, extending his right hand. We must understand this wrong if we are to resist it. In desperation or despair, Covenant thrust out his hand. The heels of their palms met. They gripped each other's thumbs. His two fingers felt weak, hopeless for Morham's purpose. But the Lord's grasp was sturdy. Hand to hand, like combatants, they stood there 
as though they were about to wrestle with some bitter ghoul. The attack came almost at once. Covenant cried out, shook as if his bones were gibbering, but he did not leap away. At the first instant, Morham's hard grip sustained him. Then the Lord threw his arm around Covenant, clasped him to his chest. The violence of Covenant's distress buffeted Morham, but he held his ground, gritted his embrace. As suddenly as it had come, the attack passed. With a groan, Covenant sagged in Morham's arms. Morham helped him, held him up until he moved and began to carry his own weight. Then slowly, the Lord released him. For a moment, their faces appeared oddly similar. They had the same haunted expression, the same sweat-damp, hollow gaze. But shortly, Covenant gave a shuddering sigh, and Morham straightened his shoulders, and the similarity faded. I was a fool, Morham breathed. I should have known. That ill is drool rockworm, reaching out with the power of the staff to find you. He can sense your presence by the touch of your boots on the earth, because they are unlike anything made in the land. Thus he knows where you are, and so where we are. It is my guess that you were untouched the day we crossed the soul seas because Drool expected us to move toward him on the river and was searching for us on water rather than on land. But he learned his mistake and regained contact with you yesterday. The Lord paused, gave what he was saying a chance to penetrate covenant. Then he concluded, O Lord, for the sake of us all, for the sake of the land, you must not wear your boots. Drool already knows too much of our movements. His servants are abroad. Covenant did not respond. Morham's words seemed to, stap, to sap the last of his strength. The trial had been too much for him. With a sigh, he fainted into the Lord's arms. So he did not see how carefully his boots and clothes were removed and packed in Dura's saddlebags, how tenderly his limbs were washed by the Lord's and dressed in a robe of white samite, how sadly his ring was taken from his finger and placed on a new patch of clingor over his heart, how gently he was cradled in Saltheart Foam Follower's arms throughout the long march of that day. He lay in darkness like a sacrifice. He could hear the teeth of his leprosy devouring his flesh. There was a smell of contempt around him, insisting on his impotence, but his lips were bowed in a placid smile. A look of fondness, as if he had come at last to approve his disintegration. He continued to smile when he awoke late that night and found himself staring into the wide ghoul grin of the moon. Slowly, his smile stretched into a taut grimace, a look of happiness or hatred. But then the moon was blocked out of his vision by foam followers' great bulk. The giant's huge palms, each as large as Covenant's face, stroked his head tenderly, and in time the caress had its effect on him. His eyes lost their ghastly appearance, and his face relaxed, drifted away from torment into repose. Soon he was deep in a less perilous slumber. The next day, the tenth of the quest, he awoke calmly, as if he were held in numb truce, or stasis between ir irreconcilable demands. A feeling of affectlessness pervaded him as if he no longer had the heart to care about himself. Yet he was hungry. He ate a large breakfast and remembered to thank the wood helven and woman who seemed to have assigned herself the task of providing for him. His new apparel he accepted with a rueful shrug, noticing in silent, dim sarcasm 
how easily after all he was able to shed himself and how the white robe flattered his gaunt form as if he were born to it then dumbly he mounted dura his companions watched him as if they felt he would fall he was weaker than he had realized he needed most of his concentration to keep his seat but he was equal to the task gradually the questers began to believe that he was out of danger among them he rode through the sunshine and the warm spring air along the flowered marge of andelaine rode attenuated and careless as if he were locked between impossibilities